Good morning. morning. Happy Easter. Easter. I'm as surprised to see you as you are to see me. Steve is sick today, so keep him in your thoughts and prayers, and uh, here I am. (laughs) There's There's a quote by Oscar Wilde, or at least he's the one credited with the quote. It says, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And what that means is, if you respect somebody enough, if you look to, up to somebody enough, you'll begin to mimic, you'll begin to imitate what it is that they do. And so my question for you this morning is, have you ever, have you ever had a hero that you looked up to? Have you ever admired someone so much that you started to mimic their behavior? Of course you have. Anybody ever drink Gatorade? Like Mike. I want to be, I I be like Mike, right? You guys remember the commercial? I just dated myself a little bit. Or... It's the shoes. It's got to be the shoes. All of us ballers thought if we had a pair of Air Jordans, we could run faster, jump higher, that we could stick out our tongues, and all of us could dunk a basketball, even us average Joes. There are these things, uh, we know them as short shorts, but short shorts are called Daisy Dukes. And it's based on the influence of the character Daisy from the Dukes of Hazard, and those are all like that was a st- uh, the Fab Five, the Michigan freshmen changed what players looked like when they played basketball. You remember, like Larry Bird had short, he had Daisy Dukes on. That's what he was wearing. He had Daisy Dukes on, all right. And then the Fab Five, those freshmen at Michigan, they started wearing those below the knee shorts, and it transformed what people wore. And here's the idea: imitation is the highest form of flattery. And I don't know who started it, you ladies that carry around, somebody's got one. I know somebody in this room has a Stanley. Those used to be work construction thermoses, and yet now it is all the rage. And somebody began this thing, and everybody thought, man, what a cool thing. Ladies, I'm going to pick on you one more time. Every time an episode of Friends came on and Rachel had a new haircut, everybody had to go to the salon and get the Rachel, right? And that's what y'all, every season when she premiered a new haircut, Every lady in America said, can you cut my hair like Rachel? That was Jennifer Aniston. I had some heroes in my life. And there's one hero, none of, none of you in this room, you've ever met him. And it was my cousin. He was a few years older than me. His name is Stephen Matthews. I adored Stephen. I watched how he held a pencil, and I would try to hold my pencil like Stephen held his. I remember we were kids, and it was Christmas, and for whatever reason, we, were, we had a sleepover, and as we were trying to wind down and go to bed, he started cring, singing Christmas carols, and we sang Jesus carols, and we sang uh, Santa Claus songs, and we sang everything, rocking around a Christmas tree, and anything that would come to mind for hours, it seemed like he and I were singing these Christmas songs, I'll never forget. He got me interested in wrestling, and I'm not talking about the Ric Flair kind, I'm talking about like the real high school collegiate wrestling. I went to watch him wrestle, and I mean, I just looked up to him so much, I was like, i got to figure out how to wrestle, and so that, that was where the influence came from. I wanted to do everything just like him. I wanted to be just like him. His smile, his laugh, his haircut, anything that Stephen did, the way he would dribble a basketball, or the way he would clap his hands together for a rebound, I wanted to be just like him. Unfortunately... Stephen died way too soon. He was young, and it was a tragic accident surrounded by confusion and chaos. And the truth of the matter is that his funeral was the first funeral that I ever preached. And even today, I see him in a smile, or I see him as somebody walks by. I see someone's eyes, and I see Stephen looking at me. You ever felt that way? Maybe it's someone's chin, but there's something, there's a smell, there's a memory, and I'm reminded of him. Maybe that word, maybe remembering is the key for today as we celebrate Jesus. What I'm going to tell you comes straight out of Luke chapter 24. Let me encourage you, today, this week, sometime, in the near future, let me encourage you to go back and read the entire chapter. That's where we're going to camp out today. You can follow along with Scripture. And here's what Luke 24 is. It is the real-life account as it happened by people who were there. It's, 
It's people telling the story as they saw it. And so that's what we're going to focus on today. Here's what you got to know as we begin in, in Luke chapter 24. Jesus was dead. They saw it with their own eyes. He had been beaten. He had been mocked. He had been crucified. And he had breathed his last. They had taken his body off the cross. They had placed him in a tomb. And that's where Jesus was. He died on Friday. On Saturday, they were celebrating God and Passover on the Sabbath. And so nobody did anything except for worship the Lord. And so they hurried up to get Jesus down off the cross and into a tomb. And some ladies went back to better prepare the body for his final resting place. But make no mistake, Jesus was dead. Hope had been crushed The revolution was dead. It was over. And I imagine as these ladies are walking to the tomb that they are silent. Maybe they're sharing, how could it have happened? He went so quickly. They didn't even have to break his legs. It says on the first day of the week, that would be Sunday. Very early in the morning, as Philip said today, just as the sun was rising so that they could see what they were doing, they were, they were going to prepare his body. They went to the tomb. They found that the stone was rolled away. The stone was to keep Jesus in and to keep thieves out so that nobody could steal the body. They wanted this story done. The Romans were sick of hearing about Jesus. The Jews were sick of hearing about Jesus. We're going we're gonna to plug the hole so that this thing is over once and for all. It says they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. When they entered, there was no body. There was no Jesus. What in the world? While they're wondering this, suddenly two men in angels, excuse me, two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down their faces to the ground. But the men said, why do you look for the living among the dead? He, talking about Jesus, Jesus isn't here, they said. He has risen. He's alive. He's no longer dead. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee that he must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, that he would be crucified, and on the third day he would be raised again. Remember what he told you? That's what the angels are telling these two ladies. And they're in shock. They're in disbelief. They couldn't believe what they were hearing. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. Verse 8 says, Then they remembered his words. Then they remembered. And they weren't sure, is he really alive? We got to tell somebody. Somebody else has got to know what we know. Somebody else may know what we don't know. Let's go find the, the others. And so they rush out of there. Heading back to the 11 and the others. It was Mary and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the others. And they're saying, you got to believe this. And on their way, Jesus encounters them. They thought he was a gardener at first. Why? Because he was dead. They had seen it. There's no way this is Jesus. And he says, it's me. Go back and tell the others. And that's what they do. Hey, you're not going to believe this. But we saw him. We went to the tomb. It was empty. And on our way here, he appeared to us. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Have you ever tried to convince somebody of something that's really difficult to believe? Have you ever, have you ever, <laughs> I appreciate that. Got it. No, never, never had that issue. You ever try to convince somebody of something that's difficult to believe? Maybe you're not quite sure to, how to explain it. Maybe you've heard of a team called NC State. How are they still playing? How is Burns so good? It's good, the, the big dancing bear. I mean, if I were, you're going to tell your kids or your grandkids, there was this big guy, and he looked slow, but man, he could play basketball. My best friend in high school reminded me of DJ Burns. If you don't know who that is, Google him, but not right now. Stick with me. But the, man, this is a big, he was our heavyweight. You know, I told you I wrestled. And Mike Imes, was our, he was our closer. At that time, we started with the lightest kid, and we ended with the heaviest kid. And so if it's a close match, guess what? Your big guy better be good. And our big guy was good. He was one of the greatest athletes I've ever known. He could dunk a basketball and he weighed 280. He looked like DJ Burns. I'm not kidding. He was a ballerina on the diving board, y'all. If you could have seen him, he could do a front flip, a one and a half, a gainer, which is where you flip backwards while jumping forward. It was unbelievable what this guy could do. 
You've never seen him, but I'm telling you, you can look him up on social media. He's a real guy. And you may be skeptical, but I'm telling you, I saw it with my own eyes. He was huge, and yet he was agile. Now that same day, let's continue with the story. Two of the disciples are going to a town, a village called Emmaus. It was about seven miles from Jerusalem. What were they doing? They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. They were remembering. They remembered the water, the wine. They remember how he fed people with five loaves and two fish, or five fish and two loaves, whichever. I can't remember at the moment. They were talking about how he'd been, how he'd been crucified. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. The women didn't recognize Jesus at first. These two disciples don't recognize Jesus at first. You say, why not? Why didn't they recognize him? Were they, were they so preoccupied? I mean, they were, they were so depressed. They were so crushed. They were heartbroken. Was, was Jesus wearing a hood? Was he disguised? Was he somehow different after his resurrection? Maybe he didn't look quite the same as he did before he had risen from the grave? Why would God prevent them from recognizing Jesus? And I think the simple answer is, nobody expected Jesus to be alive. I mean, how many dead people have you seen that have come back to life? Neither had they. There was Lazarus that Jesus had done, but outside of that, this didn't happen. And the last anyone had seen or heard, Jesus had been killed on the cross and his body had been placed in the tomb several days ago. And that's where they were. And so Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? I love that. What are you guys talking about? They stood still, their faces downcast. They were, like I said, they were, they were crushed. One of them named Cliffus, he asked Jesus, he said, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here, happened there these days? He's like, where have you been? What rock are you under? You mean to tell me you've heard nothing about Jesus? You have no idea about the crucifixion? You didn't know about the darkness? You didn't know about the rocks? You didn't know about the earthquake? You hadn't heard about what happened at the temple with the curtain? Where have you been? And Jesus says, what things? And they're going to tell him about, well, Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed before God and before all people. And he was handed over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one. We thought he was the one. We knew he was the one. What's more, it was the third day since all this took place. And, and, and get this, some of the women, women went to the tomb, and he's not there. We don't know where he is, but he's not there. They came and told us that they saw some angels. And the angel said that he was still alive. And some of our friends, Peter and John, went to the tomb. And they found it just as the women said, just as they had described. There was, there was nothing in the tomb except for the clothes that he'd been buried in. But they hadn't seen Jesus. And then Jesus said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all that the prophet prophets have spoken. Didn't the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He's saying, don't you remember? Don't you remember what, what God's word said about this? Remember in Genesis that the serpent would strike his heel and, and that the son of God would crush his head? Don't you remember don't you remember the darkness and the death and the deliverance of Egypt? Don't you remember the suffering servant of Isaiah that we just heard about? And then they continue walking. And as they're walking, they're hoping that Jesus will stay. And Jesus is like, I got things to do. And they invite him. Why don't you come and why don't you stay and why don't you eat with us? Verse 30. And so Jesus was with them at the table. 
he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it and began to give it to them. Verse 31 says, and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. They remembered. What opened their eyes? What changed? Was it something about the way that Jesus tore the bread that they seen countless times? Was it the way that he held his hand when he grasped a cup? What changed for them? What triggered the memory? Were they present at the Last Supper? Was it his smile? Was it his greeting, shalom, peace be with you? What was it? Was it something that he said? Or was it when he handed them the bread? They saw the wounds. And they knew that it was him. What was it? And just as quickly as he appeared, Scripture says that he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, did you know it was him? I thought it was him, but I wasn't sure. But when he said that, he's the only one that says it that way. Says, we're, not, we're our hearts not burning within us as he talked with us on the road. And when he was going over the Scriptures, it sounded just like him as he was teaching. And so what they do, they got up and they ran and they went back to the others and said, you gotta, you're not going to believe this. We just saw Jesus. And everybody's skeptical. Why? Because dead men don't roam among the living. Dead people stay dead. It's true, they said, the Lord is risen and he's appeared to Peter. And then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized when he broke the bread. What was the shift? What changed? They went from being crushed and sad. Their faces were looking down. They didn't want to look anybody in the eyes. What changed? What changed was an encounter with God. It's the same thing that can change you. It's the same thing that changes me today. In those moments when we least expect it, it's my prayer that is in those moments God shows up. And I ask you this morning, is there an area of your life that needs to be transformed, that needs to be touched by the resurrected Jesus Christ? Maybe you're here this morning and you're lonely. There's unbelief. You're discouraged. Maybe you want to have faith and you want to believe, but there's just not enough proof. There's not enough evidence. What would it take for you to go from being resistant to believing? Luke chapter 3. 24 verse 36 says, while they were still talking about this, Jesus stood up among them and said to them, Shalom, peace be with you. He said they were startled and frightened, thinking that they had, said they, had, they had saw a ghost. There's no way. It sounds like Jesus. And he greeted us like Jesus. But I thought he was dead. Jesus says, what are, you, what are you afraid of? What's bothering you? Why, why do you doubt? He said, look, look at my hands and look at my feet. I was dead, it's me, touch and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones. As you see, I have. It's me, it's my body. When he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe, and they're still confused, and there's, there's this cautious optimism that maybe it's him. And they're, and they're sort of wrestling through this moment where they think they've just encountered Jesus. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, I'm starving. Do you have anything here to eat? And they brought him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it in their presence. And I think as he's eating, they're like, that's him. That's exactly how Jesus eats fish. He always eats it that way. Nobody cleans the fish bones like Jesus. And I think he's digging into it and they're like, there he is. He's back. And he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And Jesus is saying over, have you picked up on the pattern? There's skepticism, 
And then they study scripture and he reveals himself and they believe. There's skepticism and there's scripture and there's an encounter and they believe. What convinced the disciples that the women were telling the truth and the two on the way to Emmaus were telling the truth? What did it take to convince people that there was an empty tomb and that there was a resurrection? What did it take? I had to see it with my own eyes. Jesus appeared to them. They saw him. They were eyewitnesses. What do you think they would say if they could stand in front of you today? What do you think Peter and James and John and Thomas, what do you think the Apostle Paul would say if he could stand up here on this stage and say, I saw him with my own eyes. I put my fingers in the holes. I'm telling you, he was as alive as I've ever seen him. Do you believe? That's what they would say. Let's make an association. I love history. How many of you have ever been to Monticello or Mount Vernon? And you see the homes of people like Thomas Jefferson or George Washington. How many of you have ever had the, had the opportunity to experience the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C.? It is, it is hollowed grounds. Moving. And I never saw, I've never been to Germany or, or Europe, and I've never been to a concentration camp, but I've seen a boxcar in that museum. And I saw the pile of shoes that belonged to children who were abandoned. And I can tell you, based on what I've seen, it happened. I've, I've walked the house where Thomas Jefferson lived. I've been there. Have you ever stood at the footprints where the, twin twi when the, where the Twin Towers once stood? How many of you saw it before it fell? How many of you were, have been there since it came down? There's a, there's a monument right there at the base, and you know exactly where the two towers stood. Here's what the, the truth of the matter is this. Their story is our story. Some may remember, there are some in this room who remember 9-11, but more and more are being born who weren't there. And they're going to take your word for it, and they're going to take my word for it. And eventually there will be a generation who was not alive during the time. And all they'll have are accounts, the words that we speak about it, and the pictures that we share. Some may remember, but one day, those alive in the future, their future will be based on what we pass along. To quote the Broadway show about the life of Hamilton, this is the question. Who lives? Who dies? Who tells your story? Verse 46 of Luke chapter 24, Jesus told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead, and on the third day, and, and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. I want you to hear this. He told them, he reminded them, he said, you are witnesses of these things. This is your story to tell. The only reason they'll believe is because of you. I think he whispers the same thing today. You, church, are my witnesses. The only way they'll know the story is if you tell it. Consider some of the unlikely witnesses to the truth, to the eyewitness accounts about who Jesus is and what he had done to, to bring us back to God. One of the books of the Bible and the New Testament is written by James, and, and maybe you don't know who James is, but let me tell you, James is the half-brother of Jesus. And there's no way I'm calling my brother or my sister God unless something very convincing happens. And James is convinced. My brother is God's son. 
born miraculously. He lived in such a way. And even when he was alive, I didn't believe it. But you know what closed the deal for me? His death, his burial, and most importantly, his resurrection. He came back from the dead, and that was all it took for me. Read the book of James. There's Thomas, a skeptic. I love Thomas because I am Thomas. There's no way I would believe unless I stuck my fingers in the the pierced hands. And I want to put my hand in Jesus' side. And Thomas said, I did that. I saw it. I touched him. And then there's Paul. Maybe you don't know the story of Paul, but Paul was Saul. And Saul hated church, and he hated Jesus, and he hated everything about the movement. And he was doing so much to make it go away. He was a Jew, and he hated this new religion. And he was doing all that he could to snuff it out. He was even killing people who were professing Christ. He was killing people who talked about just what we're talking about today, the resurrection, how this God-man came to earth and how he had conquered sin and death. And Paul was going around saying, if you believe that, I'll kill you. And that's exactly what he was doing. Yet something convinced him about the story we're talking about today. I want you to hear it from Paul's own words. He said, for what I received, I passed on to you of first importance. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That he was buried, that he, raised, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. And last of all, Paul says, Jesus himself appeared to me also. I've seen him. I've had a conversation with him. He taught me all this that I'm writing about. And so, so why does the resurrection of Jesus matter? How would you convince somebody that it's real? What's our role? Our role is to introduce, introduce people to Jesus and let them find out, let them investigate, let them explore him for themselves. You say, well, how do you do that? Remember the pattern? Use scripture. Just tell the story. Just let people read it for themselves. How well can we explain the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Tell other people What, what these who were there saw, what they experienced. And then secondly, remember your story. How an encounter with Jesus caused such a shift in your own life. Think about who you used to be before you knew Jesus, before your sins were dealt with, before your heart was changed. There's no way that this kid at 14 years old would be standing in front of hundreds of people talking about Jesus Christ apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. When I heard about Jesus, I wanted more. And I wanted more. And there's a hunger and thirst that I cannot quench. And I can't wait to see him someday. Listen to Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of us say that there's no resurrection? How can you say that when you die, it's over? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. If there's no resurrection of Jesus, this means nothing. Not this church, not your life, not your purpose. There's no meaning. Paul's saying, if there's no resurrection of Jesus, we're all fools. But what if it's true? What if he really did come back from the grave? More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is useless. It's meaningless. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. That cemetery is worthless. 
And every time we weep, it's, it's horrific if there's no resurrection. Then the last time you said goodbye, the last time I saw Stephen, when I was standing over his body, it means nothing if Jesus Christ didn't come back from the dead. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has been raised from the dead. Indeed. He is alive. And because He is alive, you will live. And all who have died will live. Because His resurrection is our resurrection. If you want to live forever, you're going to. Well, what if I don't believe in Jesus? You're going to live forever. Every person in this room will never face ultimate death. You will live forever. You may die once, but your body will be resurrected. But what about, that doesn't seem right. No, every person will live forever. And you will be with God or you will forever be separated from Him. That's true for anybody. Any human being that's ever taken a breath will live forever. That's what Paul's saying. His resurrection means all of us will be resurrected. Are you with God? Are you saved by God? If not, that is the most important decision of your life. I will see Stephen again. Your grandparents, your parents, your spouse, I promise you, you'll see him again. And the one that will introduce you will be the one with the nail-pierced hands. He'll be standing in front of him and saying, it is real, it is true. He told you that day at Jefferson Church. Do you believe it? James, Peter, Thomas, even Paul had seen Jesus. We will see him face to face. We'll see the same scars. He is alive today. Take it to the bank. Remember the resurrection, both his and consider yours. Each of us will live forever with God or we will forever be separated from him. Are you a friend of God? Are you a foe? And you say, man, I, I'm, I'm bad. I'm resistant. So was Paul. Paul was a murderer of the church. And something changed his mind. I beg you, investigate Jesus. Read this book. Read the Gospels. None of us can be more at odds with Jesus than Paul was. And look what happened to him. And I hate, to, I hate, here's, now you know. Now you know the story. What are you going to do with the story? If you've never considered Jesus before, today's the day. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the resurrection. I thank you for the hope. I thank you that you conquered sin and death, that you loved us enough that you don't want to be separated from us. You sent Jesus Christ to, to repair the relationship. God, I, I pray that we would seriously consider where our resurrection leads us. And that if there's business that needs to be done with you, if there's, if there's any kind of reaching out, that it would, it would take place just now. I love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song. If you want to talk more about this, if you're, if you're searching, maybe you're hurting, if you just want somebody to listen to you, if you want to pray, I'll be standing right over here. If you have a decision to make, I would love to walk through what a relationship looks like with Jesus Christ. Let's stand together.